Welcome to the third video on my channel. Uh, this, this video will be a little bit different. I'm not going to focus uh, specifically on one project for this uh, video, but I wanted to touch on something that um, is very common in this uh, retro computing hobby. And if you, if you spend any time in this hobby at all, you'll, you'll see it uh, over and over again. And that is keyboards uh, that for whatever reason uh, don't work. <laughs> and, um, so here we have uh, two two things that I've been meaning to fix the keyboards on uh, for a while now. Um, actually, this Franklin 1000 is one that I just got recently, um, and uh, it it suffers from uh, just the fact that the keyboard is very um, was was not designed to last 40 years, and you know here we are 40 years later, and uh, it did not survive. There are mechanisms uh, to it that. I just don't have that long of a lifespan. Um, hopefully that's very easy to um, fix, and we'll, I'll get into that uh, that computer here in a minute. Uh, the second computer is this very nice looking uh, ZX Spectrum over here. Uh, this is not actually, the, the case and, and the keyboard on this are actual uh, retro computers, uh, retro, retro gear rather. Uh, inside though is a, um, I have a Harlequin 128, um, uh, motherboard, which is a is a uh, recreation of the um, ZX Spectrum, basically a clone. Somewhat of pro appropriate that we have two clone computers here, um, and it's it's designed to fit inside of the original case and use the original keyboard uh, from the ZX Spectrum, either the either the original one or or this forty eight K. What is it? Spectrum two, Spectrum Plus. That's what it is. Sorry for. <laughs> Uh, my lack of spectrum knowledge. Um, that this was that was a real fun project. Uh, anyway, these both have keyboard issues. Uh, I I believe I have what it takes or what what I, is needed to uh, get both of them fixed. They should be relatively quick. Um, I'm going to jump into the uh, the Franklin first uh, and walk you through that, and uh, hopefully um, hopefully you guys enjoy. At the very end of the video, I will have a, an update, also keyboard related on the uh, keyboard from the last project that I worked on, the, the Apple II Plus that had uh, a keyboard from 1980 that, um, you know, again, had, had issues, uh, had some key switches that were not working. And I'll give you a, a brief update on that at the end of this video. All right, here we go. And here is the Franklin 1000 on the workbench. Um, just before I get started, I want to say that, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with this machine, this was a an Apple II clone, essentially one of the very famous um, Apple II clones made in America. Uh, Franklin actually, instead of being a fly-by-night company that just uh, made Apple knockoffs, which were super common, uh, they actually tried to be a, an above-board company and, and legally contested uh, Apple's ability to copyright things such as uh, the contents of their ROMs. Um, the Apple II in general, the, the parts that went into making it were so off the shelf that it was probably hard to protect with a copyright the actual hardware. Um, but the ROMs, that, that's where Apple went after people. And this, they actually, since Franklin was a, a, an above board company and was um, not hiding somewhere overseas, Apple was able to sue them and this actually went to court. Uh, and famously, Franklin uh, lost. Um, over this project essentially right here. Um, I will say that uh, back in the day when I, I was an Apple owner uh, around this time, certainly an Apple user, and um, the impression that the, the community around Apple would want, you, would want you to have believed is that the Franklins were cheap and that if you bought one, you know, you were going to get what you paid for, and uh, the quality would be low, and the reli reliability would be low, etc. Um, when I finally acquired one of these, I was fairly shocked to find that not only is it a, a very handsome, very solidly put together um, a machine, but um, everything about it to me says this was a high quality product. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to break. <laughs> the plastic isn't cheap and flimsy, etc. Um, very impressive machine. Um, 
and actually internally too, it was more than just an Apple II, a straight clone of the motherboard. They actually did their own engineering. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things that they did though, probably uh, cut some corners on, is they used a so-called foam and, fe and, um, and foil approach to the keyboard where instead of having individual key switches on each key, they had more of a plunger system with a conductive uh, pad underneath that would hit onto a circuit board. And that foam, of course, over time um, just degrades and turns into a powder, which is what I'm assuming has happened to this keyboard. Uh, now, luckily, there are, there are ways to repair those, and there is even at least one uh, individual or company that, that supplies those replacement foam pads already made. Uh, they, they were used across a wide variety of, of computers, so um, the same uh, foam and foil replacement pads can be used to repair most of them. Um, and if you're interested, of course, TechSelec is the uh, is the, the the guy that makes those um, kits to re re repair these keyboards. Um, I'll put his um, a link to his page in in the comments. But yeah, let's uh, let's um, get this case off and. Um, get the keyboard exposed and, and, and see what we're dealing with. Okay, we've got the machine uh, flipped upside down. Um, there's just a number of screws holding the case, the bottom pan to the case. Let's, uh, let's just get those taken off. I will say these screws uh, are not very well, they don't feel very set. If you know what I mean, uh, I, I would assume that someone has taken this apart before. They are not even, in most cases, very tight. Uh, they do seem to be fairly shallow screws. Um, let's see, we just need to take all these out. These screws here are what hold the power supply in, so I'm not going to remove those. Okay, now carefully flip it back over. Everything should be loose at this point. All right, there is a keyboard connector that um, runs from the keyboard to the motherboard. The keyboard, of course, is attached to the case, so I did loosen that already. Um, Actually, I disconnected it. Let's just pull the case off very slowly, watching for other things that might be connected. And it seems like we're mostly free, except for the 80 column cord, which goes, I have looped through, so. This, this machine has a Vitex um, 80 column board installed, which is nice. Um, it has this permanently attached cord, which is oftentimes kind of a pain. Okay, and <laughs> uh, nicely, here's where I have stored the Texelec um, foam and foil uh, capacitance pads to replace this. So I'll get the, the keyboard flipped over and uh, we'll, we'll get started on this. Here is the underside of the, the case with the keyboard exposed. Um, it looks like it's a uh, it's a Keytronic keyboard. They were a keyboard maker back in the day. Um, quite the contrast to the probably several years older Apple keyboard that I worked on in the last episode, where all the traces were clearly hand drawn, uh, not on a grid. Uh, looked very 1970s electronics. Uh, here we see at, at least a very very. Uh, nicely grid aligned sort of a, a layout on this one. Um, it's held in by these four screws here. Let's just take those out.
I don't actually know. I, I, I'm, I've heard the name Keytronic many times. I kind of want to say that they also made keyboards for Apple at some point. Um, I'm sure for many other uh, makers of PCs from the, around this era. Um, all right, here we go. That should just let this lift completely out. Always want to make sure that things are free. Uh, and it is, except for the power LED, which luckily is on a nice connector. fighting me for some reason. Hmm. All right, out, out of, uh, I looked, took a little closer look at that um, LED connector. I think you can just pry that off out of there. It just snaps out. However, out of an abundance of caution, I'm just gonna leave it connected. Um, the next thing I need to do is to take out uh, each one of these um, screws, probably there's one underneath here. Anyway, there's a, a large number of these smaller screws here. I need to get pull those out to remove the printed circuit board um, and get at the foam pad. So let's just go ahead and do that now. appear to be either coated or um, brass maybe no, probably coated some sort of corrosion inhibitor gives them a brass like color and at first I thought maybe they were rusted which would be a somewhat scary sign but that does not appear to be the case uh, and these are not in there super tight they are coming right out which is always nice They do seem to have a little bit of a set to them, where they hear that kind of click when they, when you un, uh, un when you loosen them, like that. Um, it makes me think that, that they have never been out of the board since the day that they were uh, put together, which of course is always a good sign with these old computers. have not spotted a date yet on this. Oh, there we go, uh, 1982 for this, uh, when this keyboard was put together. That makes sense. I think Franklin uh, got into the computer, the Apple II clone business early um, with a machine that they made before this one that was much more of a direct a hardware copy of the Apple II, as I understand it, called the Ace uh, 500, a computer that I have only ever seen pictures of, but they very quickly moved on to um, this machine, which, as I mentioned, hardware-wise is, is a little bit more than your average Apple II clone. I mean, it, it is basically uh, functionally equivalent. Um, so it's not completely different, but the engineering clearly uh, was done not just in a, a, the method of, of copying. That's, I think there's probably a screw under here. I am wrong, I just pulled that off for nothing. This is sort of just a, um, a sticky pad for uh, cable retention. As you can see, they give you quite a long keyboard cable. I assume that that uh, this keyboard would this keyboard would essentially be also uh, directly compatible with an Apple if for some reason you wanted to plug it into a, an Apple II motherboard, which I have seen <laughs> Franklin uh, cases with Apple II motherboards inside of them. You always wonder what happened there. Okay, that's all of the um, screws out, I believe. Let's. Oh, I will. Uh, yeah, I actually do have to take. No, let's see here. 
let's lift this off and see what comes next. Okay, it's clearly free. Right, okay, that makes sense. And so you can see on this side, there uh, are just a series of contacts, very simple. And then in here, each key has a plunger that pushes on the back of a foam pad that has a conductive uh, material on one side. Um, I'll, I'll get you in for a closer look. And that would, that would short out these connections, and um, th then you have a key press. Um, let's see if I can get you a little closer look at this board as well. Here's that uh, keyboard matrix board. Um, some sort of assembly number there. Um, essentially, this is the same circuitry that would be on an Apple II motherboard, but on a separate, um, or not on the motherboard, on the back of the keyboard on a separate daughter board, the uh, encoder board that would, it handles all the encoder logic. I think Franklin's is slightly more complicated. It is natively, um, upper and lower case, which Apple did not have. Um, so anyway, let's take a look at the actual keyboard itself. All right, here's the back of that keyboard. And essentially each one of these um, uh, spaces is where a key is. And you'll note that there are um, some blanks on this keyboard. Obviously this particular keyboard was not made specifically for Franklin Keytronic probably supplied this to uh, other customers that wanted different key layouts. Each one of these little wells just has a, um, yeah. So in here, you can see, um, so there is a little, what is left of a little pad. Make sure I'm getting this. Um, and you can see that on one side of it, there was originally a uh, um, some sort of conductive backing. There was foam in the middle, which has deteriorated. It's not quite dust yet on this one, which some of them just fall to dust. Um, uh, and then the last piece, which is now stuck in this um, spot, is a little um, like a harder piece of plastic uh, that is just held in by these little clips and I think I can just carefully yeah, pop these out so I gather up these pieces and give you another look so here here's the the backing this would essentially forms a, um, a little bit of a sandwich with this sort of hard support backing on top of the foam a, the layer of foam itself and then um, the conductive pad here and each one of these is just uh, perished. Um, I'm just going to go through and pick each one out. Um, yeah, and, and go from there. And this is really just uh, very repetitive doing it the same exact thing over and over again so i will uh, cut here and i'll bring you back when i've got each of the spots uh, cleaned out okay there we are with um, all the pads out there are quite a number of them uh, quite a pile of pads that i ended up with let me give you a little bit closer view um, of some of the old pads compared to some of the, the new pads that we're gonna put in. Okay, here we've got some of the um, original pads over here. Um, you can see um, the, the foam has degraded in um, to quite a variety of ways. This one seems to have been stuck here. Um, some, of them do, some of them the foam doesn't look terrible. Some of them the foam looks absolutely horrendous and is actually falling apart. Um, Next to them, I have some of the ones from TechSelect, which obviously the foam is really nice and springy. The main thing that you'll notice, though, is um, just how shiny the conductive side is on, on these TechSelect ones. This is the this is the back side with the harder, um, sorry, the harder uh, plastic part, and this is the conductive side. Whereas this is actually the conductive side from the old pads, and you can see, I don't, I kind of think they used to be much more silvery 
uh, originally. Let me see if I can flip one over. Uh, you know the the back. This is and this is the back side. And really on on the, this is the back side. Uh, on the on these old ones, there's almost no visual difference. It's clear which one was which because they have a very soft and kind of springy. Whereas these, uh, the harder plastic side uh, is still uh, fairly hard. But on the yeah on these tech select ones, not only is the foam. Oops, hope I didn't lose that one. Um, <laughs> not only is the the foam nice and springy still, but um, the conductive side looks looks much much better. Um, and yes, these things uh, are hard to keep track of, and they they fly all over the place. This is a good time to be using uh, eye protection when you're taking these out. <laughs> all right, uh, let me get set up, and I'll start swapping in uh, the new ones. Okay, the installation of the um, of the new ones is really just going to be a the reverse of the of the the process of, of taking the old ones out. Um, here's a little bit close up view of the the inside of the key plunger, and you can see that there's just this white piece of plastic here, and then there's these little clips uh, on the sides, and that's what the hard plastic portion of the pad hooks under, with the conductive surface facing up, and then uh, you know inside of here there is a uh, a plunger and a return spring. This happens to be on the space bar, but they're very much uh, the same on, on all of them. And that's how the basic mechanism works to push that conductive pad down onto the, the contacts on the back of the keyboard. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of the reinstall. I think it's also going to be fairly repetitive and boring. Um, so I'll, I'll cut away after a bit. I think the biggest trick here is just to not, you know, avoid um, avoid in any way damaging these these uh, little plastic clips, which uh, they could be uh, brittle. But I think basically you're just gonna we're just gonna be uh, dropping a little pad in each hole and then getting them to clip under, which might be easier said than done. I wonder if I can just. Um, Snap these down directly without crushing the. Okay, these are a bit fiddly. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, work at this a little bit. I don't want to ruin any of them, um, and I'll bring you back when I have a little bit more success. Okay, I, I think I've more or less got this figured out. It's pretty fiddly, uh, I have to say. Um, it's gonna take a while to put all these in, but what I what the method that I think works best is this and. It, Apologies in advance if I end up blocking the camera or this view just isn't very good. It's it's it is extremely fiddly So the trick is to get the hard plastic wafer underneath these four clips uh, On the side so what I uh, have had success with so far is I drop the the piece in there and then I raise the key up from the other side and then I carefully and I probably should have a better tool for this Carefully push the the little disc down underneath those four clips, um, and you know even when you have it, it oh okay that's clearly in there. Yeah, there's a nice little click when they're in there, and then you know you can clearly see the how that's supposed to work. So I'm gonna um, struggle with the rest of these, and I'll bring you back when I have them uh, all installed. Alrighty, there we have all of the new pads installed, and man, I am not gonna lie, that was super fiddly. Um, I'm, I would say, 100% sure that there are at least a couple of these that are not completely clicked in. It is super challenging to get those little plastic discs to click under those little, um, little teeny clips, and you know, not feel like you're breaking anything. Um, I will say this. Uh, TechSelec supplied a really generous amount. I mean, these, these are the ones that I have left over. Um, in the event that I end up having to take some of these out uh, and, and try different ones, I have plenty of leftovers. So that, that's super awesome. Um, I'm going to just double check these really quick. Um, I think they're all, you know, even though they're not perfect, I think they're all good. Like none of them stick up above the uh, the keyboard when it, when they're in the up position, and and all of them seem like they would go down. And I, I I've given them a good shake. 
exercised them a bit. None of them fell out. None of them are hanging down. Um, yeah, so I'll get this reinstalled shortly and we'll go from there. And here we have the machine uh, all back together. Um, and I have gone ahead and uh, as you can see, it looks like every single key, upper, lower case, is all working and none of that was before. Um, and that includes uh, the shift lock key with, you know, illuminated and all that. Um, so yeah, total success on this one. That is super cool. Let's get on to uh, the next one. So here we have keyboard uh, project number two. Uh, as you can see, this is a uh, absolutely retro ZX Spectrum Plus case. Um, and as I mentioned, inside of here is not an actual ZX Spectrum, but rather a Harlequin uh, 128, which is a, if you aren't familiar, it's a Spectrum clone. And it's made to use uh, the original case and the original keyboard style connectors. Now, uh, this particular example is one that I, I put together as a kit from uh, ByteDelight.com. Um, highly, highly recommend this kit to anyone who wants to um, practice a lot of soldering, uh, but not a lot of difficult soldering. It was all it was a very, very nice kit, very well put together, and just super, super fun to um, construct. However, let me go ahead and disconnect the, the keyboard that is in here now, and I'll show you what <laughs> where things kind of went wrong. Um, so, if you're not familiar, the ZX Spectrum uses these um, uh, sort of um, very, very flimsy uh, ribbon connectors that go into directly into these connectors here. Um, all of that is fairly fragile. So when I built this computer, um, it all went together very nicely. Um, there's a reset switch, let me get rid of that. Um, and and I, I wanted a keyboard for it. And so I, I, I was lucky enough to find this case with a brand new, uh, they call this a membrane, the, the keyboard, um, uh, the, the portion of the keyboard that actually does the contacts. Um, and I was able to find one of those, purchase it, everything was great. When I test fit it, however, um, on the smaller of these two brackets, uh, it just, it, it, it actually like stripped the coating off of these, um, these very, very flimsy, delicate uh, connectors here. Um, and I tried, to, after seeing that, I tried to then um, maybe adjust this one. I poked around at it, trying to make it not so tight. Um, and I, I ruined this connector. Um, and so my thought is, um, I, I, have, um, I have acquired some uh, replacement connectors, apparently from somewhere called Retro.Care. Um, and I'm gonna buzz these old connectors out, put these new connectors in. I'm gonna try it with this existing keyboard. Um, I hope I haven't damaged it too much, but if I have, I have an, another uh, replacement membrane that actually looks a much higher quality. So anyway, let's get this out and I'll, uh, I'll buzz these off of here with the, the desoldering station um, and, and we'll go from there. So I don't have this screwed in so we can just Lift it out like so, set all this aside carefully. Oops, not carefully enough apparently. I have disassociated one of the keys. <laughs> okay. So there we go. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna um, flip these over and desolder this uh, and then we'll go from there. I'll let my desoldering station uh, warm up a bit. Let's see, let's make sure that we know what we're looking at here. Okay, it's this lower set of pins over here. And, oh, let's do this one first. Uh, again, apologies in advance if my 
head obscures the um, your view. I do need to get in fairly close to see these little teeny connections and and uh, buzz these out of here. Actually, let me put a mat underneath this. I'll, while, while the desolder is um, is powering up, I'll I'll put a mat under here. I'll be right back. Okay, there we go. Desoldering station is up to temp. Let's see. This should go. Wow, not gonna jinx it too bad. This should, it should go pretty easily. Yeah, yeah that's looking really nice. By the way, if you do any amount of soldering at all and you are wondering if it's worthwhile to invest in one of these desoldering guns, I'm using one of the just sort of generic uh, vacuum stations. They are, they are wonderful. And just like that, as you can see, we've got, we've got this probably ready to pop out of there. Yeah. Sometimes they're just a little bit stubborn and you have to sort of, uh, let me, uh, I've, I've rearranged things and I don't have my tools handy. Let me um, grab some stuff and I'll be right back. All right, so let's just check each one of these pins, see if any of them are still stuck a little bit. Okay. They are still a little bit attached, so let's let's give this another pass here and see if we can really break them loose. Okay. Let's see if that's any better. These connectors feel um, a little bit flimsy. Just gonna try to get these final legs. Okay, we are all clear except for this final leg here. And now we should be. Yeah. Okay. And now it's just absolutely loose in there. Um, this connector is probably fine. This is not the one I ruined. This is the larger one that I ruined. Um, but it was just sharp enough when it shredded the uh, original keyboard connector. I don't know. I just I just thought I'd go with another one, and, and they come as a set anyway. So there we go. Um, all right. So again, this one has a, a resistor pack right. Uh, here, which has you know a, a similar row of pins, we want to make sure that we don't desolder the resistor pack. We want to only desolder, uh, only desolder the connector, and that is from this orientation the top row of pins. Um, also, wanted to mention that you know this with this black painted circuit board like this, uh, it looks really nice, but it's kind of a pain to um, to work with in many ways. It's just uh, it's hard to see where things go, etc. All right, let's see if this goes as easily. I kind of imagine that it will, yeah. Oh, that one didn't go too long. Okay, that one's being a little stubborn. This is that one, hmm. Some of these are not cleaning out as well as the other the other one did. Most of them are though. Okay, so yeah. Let's just see what we've got here. Okay, all of these are loose and clear. 
There are a few that where the solder still wants to hang out in there. Um, let me just grab some solder here. We'll just add a little bit of extra. If you're at all wondering what the answer to getting stubborn solder out is, it's usually, ironically, more solder. So, um, yeah, we'll just do this in in situ here. There we go. I'm gonna try on my fan here. I always forget that right until about the time that there's smoke rising up and I'm breathing it in. Okay, this looks like it's working pretty well. Okay, that one's still a little bit stubborn. Um, there we go, nice. Okay, let's make sure that they're all actually loose. Looks like that one on the end there. So near the end is not actually loose. Okay, probably is now. This one here. Yeah. Okay, those are. I think this should just lift out of here now. Sometimes it's challenging with the you know that many pins just to get them all. Um, lined up so that they want to come out of there even. Oh, okay, one of these is still hanging on. Okay, it's that one. I kind of feel like I'm re-soldering some of these inadvertently. Sure looks loose now. Let's just lift it up and out of there. Yeah, that's not connected anymore. This is, um, this whole circuit board here is very uh, tight. <laughs> All the components are very close together. Um, Makes it kind of hard to grab things and that sort of thing. Oh, that's just not wanting to come out. Let's see if I can just sort of motivate it here. Okay. Clean all the blob of solder off that desoldering gun. Hmm. Well, this is turning into more of a chore than I thought it would be. Honest, this is usually not this hard. Oh uh, boy. can't even imagine trying to do that all with uh, like a, one of those manual solder suckers. Okay, there's the uh, 
And there's that one out of there. I'm gonna reset up with my uh, actual soldering gun and we'll put the, um, we got the new ones on there. Okay, so I've got the new parts ready to be installed. And the only thing that you have to be a little bit careful of here is, um, you know, this connector goes here and this connector goes here. But of course they're symmetrical, so there, and there is a correct way around here for these. So I'm being very careful looking at photographs, etc. I'm just gonna pop this in here. Dropping it first, of course, as is tradition. Okay, just gonna pop that in and uh, secure it with the minimum amount of painter's tape so it doesn't fall out on me. Uh, now let's just get this in place here. Of course I'm gonna do one leg, make sure it's still in place, it is. Sit leg here. I like to just do, you know, two legs on anything I'm installing and then just inspect it to make sure it's flush and as I expect it to be, this one is. And now I can just go ahead and do the uh, the rest of it just if, if I had those two legs uh, soldered and it wasn't it was crooked or whatever I could I could readjust it at that point fairly easily much easier than if it had multiple legs soldered so we're just gonna get the rest of these all right let's check those out those look pretty good okay and now we're just going to repeat that over here uh, with the longer one. Luckily all of those holes cleaned out really nicely with the desoldering. Uh, let's see. I think I can just do this. I'll put a little extra tape on here just to Make sure the ends are really down. Again, if I didn't, uh, if I were to get one of these crooked or lifted a little bit, uh, I could I could adjust it. So, all right, let's go with this end. Okay, that looks pretty good, but it also kind of looked like it moved. Yeah, that looks good. Again, we'll get the opposite leg. Pull these off now. Give it an inspection. Huh, that's interesting. I had noticed that before. This connector actually seems to be crooked, but it could only do that if the pins were uh, crooked in the back. That's really interesting. I think I am going to pull this. <laughs> well, shoot. Uh, let me let me consider for a second. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, that was an excellent example of um, the, the ability to readjust things um, if you've only soldered two of the legs. Upon inspecting it, I saw that this was actually canted a lot that way, visually. I didn't think there was enough room for that to happen, but it did. Um, so I just reheated the, that leg and straightened the connector. And so now everything looks good. Uh, and let's just finish up 
these connections here. It's always better to take your time and resolder things if you need to, you know, adjust before you've really committed yourself. Um, because you just save yourself a lot of work and time. Okay, that should be that. Quick inspection. Indeed, that looks pretty good. Double check these over here. Yep. Okay, so now we have our, our two uh, new connectors. Let's get it installed into the board um, and uh, try it out. All right, let's get that case back on there. Let's get the solder out of the way. This thing fits just so nicely in this case, almost like it was made for it. Okay, there's the bottom. Like I said, I'm gonna go ahead and try this with the um, uh, the original, uh, well, <laughs> with the membrane that I received with it um, first. Actually, first of all, let me get these feet reinstalled. They become very difficult to install after you've <laughs> got the case all together. Uh, let's see, I think they go. Just like that, right there. Okay, so herein lies the the reason that I think most people hate these connectors is they tend to be not as long as you would like. Um, actually, before I do this, let me perform the most important ritual of putting some deoxid in there. It might actually help the connectors slide in as well. Be right back. All right, deoxid in hand. I find sometimes, I mean, even if you don't have corrosion or connection issues, this can act as a little bit of a lubricant for some of these parts that are really, um, I mean, they're friction fit, so it makes sense that something that makes them slide a little bit better might be good. Okay, now for the tricky bit. And again, the thing about these um, these flat connections is you, you have a little bit of room for uh, a recovery from damage, and that is that the ends can be trimmed, which I have done to get rid of the damaged portions. Um, the upside of, or the result of that, though, is that the, these, these uh, flat, ribbons just get shorter and shorter, which makes the installation more and more tricky. Okay, this one's going in really tight for some reason. Oh, that feels good. Okay, both of those are in. I feel correct. All right. Um, Take this into a monitor and uh, see what we got. Fingers crossed. All right, here we have the machine set up. I'm running it through uh, an open source scan converter onto my uh, into a SCART connection, <laughs> converting that to an HDMI and into my uh, my television. Um, let's go ahead and um, power it on. I have a, a um, diagnostic ROM image in here and selected currently. And let me show you uh, what is happening. Um, if I am quick, I can get this into a keyboard test mode. So let's see if I can do that. Okay, apparently I'm quick. So um, not all is well. The K is from me hitting K to go into keyboard test. F seems to be stuck. Um, and I'm hitting A right now, nothing, Q, nothing. And I'm kind of wondering if maybe that um, F being stuck is sort of completing that, you know, if that's all part of the same matrix. Um, so most of the keys actually work, which 
I think as we've discussed, is not really uh, good enough. Um, so my suspicion is that this is uh, now the um, the fault, if you will, of the um, uh, of the membrane that is in here. Let me go ahead and pop that out. I'll pop in my replacement membrane, and we'll see if we get uh, better results. Fingers crossed. Alrighty, I've swapped out the uh, membrane that came with the case and put in a new one. Sorry for not getting that on camera. Um, it's just kind of a pain to, to reset up to get that, and it's relatively straightforward. I mean, you're just taking out the old one and putting the, the, the new one back in its place. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and um, fire this up and see what we get. Okay, so right away we can see that the F key is no longer stuck open. Uh, one works. Wow, that looks a lot better. All right, um, I would say that is success. Uh, that's pretty cool to see. I've, I've had this machine um, completed. Um, but not, uh, not actually able to function for quite some time now. Um, and there we go. So um, let me switch back, reconfigure to boot into an actual um, basic, and uh, we'll go from there. I, I do have one confession to make. Um, I, I uh, Just now when I swapped those membranes out, I committed uh, the cardinal sin of uh, working on electronics, and that is, believe it or not, I left the machine powered up when I pulled the, the old keyboard uh, membrane out and put the new one in. Um, <laughs> that's that's really dumb. Um, anyway, no harm done apparently. Let me let me switch those ROMs and uh, we'll show a little running basic real quick. Okay, I've got um, the um, Harlequin 128 reconfigured uh, to boot into a ROM image from a Spectrum. Um, plus two, I believe, 128 plus two, there we go, we're going to go into 128k basic, and we'll just write a quick little obligatory, obligatory print keyboard is slightly unusual, so I'm having to uh, absolutely hunt for the keys that I want. So we should be able to muddle through. Like 10. And there we go. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's pretty cool. I, I'm I'm really glad I got this machine uh, pretty much working. Um, it was really quite a disappointment when I got it all soldered together. Got the collected up all the keyboard parts and all that, and, and put it together, and it didn't work. Um, it didn't. Um, um, let's tell it no. Okay. Um, but yeah. Um, whoops. Let's see. All right. Cool. Um, all right. So two successful uh, keyboard related projects. Um, let me go grab that, uh, the Apple II keyboard from the last video and give you a quick update on that one as well, just to round things out. Okay. Here's that uh, 1980 um, Datanetics keyboard from the uh, Apple II Plus Rev4 project that I did last time. Uh, in that video, I really sort of pretty much just glossed over the keyboard. I said it didn't work, um, and I wasn't sure I was able really to get it fixed. I've gone back through and um, just done uh, sort of the minimum that you can get done, and, and that is pull some of the keycaps off and put start putting a deoxid um, down the stems. And every single um, 
key that has a cap on it here actually is working. Um, some of these were definitely not working before I poured uh, copious amounts of deoxit down the, the stems. Um, the ones that are, are still not capped here uh, still refuse to work. So I kind of feel like um, having having read up on these key switches, these are the um, Datanetics DC51s. They are just a very known failure point. They have a sealed membrane inside that once it becomes unsealed, it's not going to work again, um, pretty much regardless of what you do. However, I did get the vast majority of these working again. Um, I'm going to keep my eye open for replacement switches for these. My feeling is that probably... Uh, these will continue to go bad over time. They just they just wear out after a while, and they aren't uh, aren't really repairable at that point. But that being said, most of the keys now work on this keyboard, so I'll keep my eyes open for more uh, key switches. I'm still going through the deoxid process on some of these. Seems like every once in a while, every couple of days, a new one will start working. Some of them are a little bit intermittent, um, but yeah, that's anyway. That's the the status on that keyboard from last time. Um, yeah, if you happen to know anybody with a bunch of DC-51 switches sitting around, uh, let me know. <laughs> In any case, um, I think that's it for this video. Um, you know, basically keyboard-centric, covered a lot of different types of, or well, several different types of keyboards with different types of problems, um, and with the exception of this keyboard here, um, got them working. So, uh, Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, let me know if you have uh, ideas uh, for future videos. I'm I have a few more Apple II centric videos um, sort of planned out, as well as kind of an interesting just project video that uh, I've been thinking about doing for a while now. Um, but anyway, if you have ideas or uh, comments or suggestions, certainly um, let me know. Uh, I really appreciate that kind of thing and. Um, it's really neat to me to be able to do maybe some videos that people um, have expressed interest in beforehand. So anyway, once again, uh, that's it for the keyboard video, and uh, hopefully I will see you guys soon.